Hey everyone, Pot ISA, and welcome to part two of our Tamiya 132nd F51 Mustang video build. So, part one has done phenomenal on the channel. It's had like four and a half times the views they normally would. Loads of good feedback, loads of new subscribers as well. So, obviously, it was a good move forward for the channel and for myself to build aircraft. A whilst I don't enjoy it as much as cars, I am enjoying this build to a degree. And if we can push through and get it done, there's a good chance there'll be more on the channel as well. So, <laughs> we'll jump straight in without any waffle, and let's start off where we left off last time. Hey everyone, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, get notified of our latest videos, give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and leave a comment. I do read and appreciate every comment you guys and girls leave behind. I may not reply to them all, but they are all appreciated. And there's a link in the description of the video that takes you to a big long list of all handy videos and a lot of the products I use in my videos. You now have the chance to support the video content creation by using Patreon or the PayPal me link in the description down below. All the videos always remain free to watch. This is just your chance to help support the videos. So this is where we left off after part one. Everything being prepped, primed, base painted, masked, and any prime parts painted up. We use various colours. We use some AK real colours for the green and the black. Um, and now we're going to add some detail to it. So we need to detail paint a few parts. Uh, we're going to weather a few parts as well. Um, and hopefully get our cockpit looking a little bit more interesting and lifelike. So first off, we need to do some dry brushing. Now, I don't have many uh, brush paintable water-based paints anymore, uh, which is going to change. So I needed a grey to dry brush over the black parts. Uh, luckily, we've got Ultima Grey Primer, which is a water-based acrylic. So on our flat brush, get as much off it as we possibly can, and then lightly dry brush over all the raised areas and that'll leave our dry brush effect you literally want nothing left on that brush and this will highlight and accentuate all that raised detail that's a case going around the entire surface area and highlighting everything and what this does adds a bit of tonal interest and a bit of variation and it also gives the part a bit more depth as well makes them look a lot more interesting and not just a monotone block of black so we do that on the engine, on the supercharger assembly as well. Then we can repeat it on any other black parts. And then we'll do the same on the green colors on the interior um, using a lighter, tone, a lighter tone of the base color. So it's a nice technique. It's a good one to learn, but less is more. You literally want that brush as dry as possible. And you'll see... Um, the first time that you come to do it, if you've got too much on the brush, it'll just overload the part, ruin the effect. If you've got just enough, it will literally put grey on those raised parts. You can see there that instrument panel coming alive, all the dials um, looking a lot more 3D effect now. Uh, we can accentuate this further on, uh, which we'll do a little bit later. But it's just a case going around, doing everything we can. And as you can see, it just brings a bit of life to what would be boring black monotone parts. So no expensive brush here. This is just a Abtablung uh, flat brush that I've had for years. It's a general purpose weathering brush. Uh, in fact, I don't even think it's Abtablung. I think it's actually a Tamiya brush. It is a Tamiya brush. It's one of Tamiya's HF brushes. Um, these are a good range of brushes, cheap, um, Good quality without being um, you know, compromised by the price. And they do a good job coming a selection of wide uh, and smaller or thinner flat brush and then a pointed detail brush as well. So we've got some of the AK real colours, the interior green here. We've got a couple of drops of white in there. I'm just going to mix this together. What we're looking for is a lighter tone of the base colour we've put down in the cockpit. And then we'll use the same effect to dry brush. Now, you've got to be careful with lacquer because lacquer on lacquer will reactivate it. So really, less is more here. So we really need to make sure that brush is really dry of as much paint as possible. 
Um, the effect isn't going to be as noticeable as on black parts because the black is a lot more of a starker color than the green. But it's the exact same technique. We just get our paint off our fingers. Yeah, there's a little bit there. Um, and then we go around all the parts. And again, just lightly brush. And what we'll do, we'll add all that lighter tone on all the raised parts. And it's the first step of a bit of weathering. So we just go all the way around. Make sure there's nothing on that finger. We don't want to get any paint splodges, especially lacquer, because if you put lacquer on lacquer, you will reactivate it. So just take your time all the way around until you're happy with the effect. Like I say, on the green, it's a lot more subtle than the black, but it does show through. And as you can see, if I zoom in a little bit, you can see how the edges of all the raised areas have started to stand out a bit more, become a bit more prominent. It's a good effect. It's a good start. It's a good base to our weathering. We can come in and add some chipping as well, a wash, and we can even go as far as pigments. So there's that onto the seat. Exactly the same process. We're just lightly dry brushing over the top of the parts. We're not putting any excess pressure on. Just the end of the brush. Lightly drag it over, and it will highlight any raised areas or edges. Like so. It's a nice simple weathering technique. Apart from that, you don't want to pull parts off like that. We'll glue that back on a little bit. But it's a nice simple weathering technique and it does add a lot of depth and variation to the colours. And again, we can use it on the flat areas as well. And there we go. Like I say, we're on the first stages of our weathering. So it can look a bit odd at first, but once we combine this all together with a wash, some chipping, um, adding some more shades of metallic colour, it can look a lot more interesting, and it'll give us a nice warm look to our cockpit. Now we've got some decals to go down. We've got an instrument panel, we've got some placards for those side walls of the cockpit, uh, a couple behind the seat, and that's it in here really. So, instrument panel, on the Tamiya 32nd scale kit, you have the front uh, binnacle, which we just uh, dry brushed. There's then a clear part that sits in the back, and this decal, as you can see, is printed back to front. That sits on the clear part, and once you put it into the binnacle, you can see it through the dial. So, normal decaling technique here. Into some warm water. This is probably lukewarm. It's been in the caves, so it's about 20 odd degrees. So, room temperature water, really, rather than lukewarm. And just in case, give it 20, 30 seconds to saturate. And then carefully pop it onto the clear part. Be very careful. Make sure you line it all up with all those instruments. As you can see, I'm just turn it around to have a little look. It needs a little bit of a, a smidge of movement. So we'll get that now while we can. Once we're happy, we can get a cotton bud. We'll get rid of any excess moisture from behind it. And then we come in with our decal solutions. I've gone straight to the strong on this. What we're going to do, we're going to pop it on, make sure all those air bubbles are gone, make sure it's seated exactly where we want it, and then leave it alone. Let it do its work. Like I say, we've got a few more decals as well. My camera's playing up a little bit here, not focusing. Been a bit of a pain lately doing this. I like focusing on the back of my hand, not so much on the decal which is where I have to focus aimed. But nevertheless, you can see the decal going now. I wanted the side of the seat back in, and then some placards for the interior. And again, same process. Use a cotton bud, get rid of any moisture from behind. Then we hit it with some strong ultimate decal solution. Get those set. Leave those for a good few hours to set before we do anything else. Make sure you get everything lined up. There we go. Now, chipping, we've got some Velo model uh, silver. We've got a little bit of packing sponge. I folded it over and put it in one of my crocodile clips. I thought it was zoomed in here, and I'm not. I do apologize. Uh, and all we're doing is same technique as dry brushing. We load the sponge up with silver paint. We use the uh, kitchen paper to the right to take off nearly all of it. And then we just lightly dab this over. And we're using a sponge, it'll give a random. Uh, speckled effect 
uh, we want to put this on any high wear areas so the edge of the seat the middle of the seat anywhere where contact will be made that could rub off the paint so less is more here really is less is more now because we used a lacquer base paint here we go we zoomed in now i'm using a water-based acrylic over the top should you go too far if you've got some of the layers airbrush cleaner whilst i don't rate it as an airbrush cleaner because it's rubbish um, it will take the Vallejo paint off um, the surface without damaging the lacquer paint underneath. Don't try it with UMP cleaner because it will go straight through the paint, uh, which shows you how good our brush cleaner is. But the Vallejo stuff will take it off. And you can use that to your advantage sometimes if you put a little bit too heavy on uh, or you're not quite sure how it looks. But I'm quite happy. There was barely any paint on the sponge, and it's going down just where I want it. Just nice. As you can see, it's a real light touch I'm giving it. There's no real pressure. Just take my time. And fill it in. That's it. There we go. I think we've got a nice ejector pin mark there, but we're not really, really going to see that. So, not much of an issue. And we can go around. So, yeah, aim for the edges of parts because that's where there were would take pace. We're going to do a little bit of dry brushing with the silver you can as well, just to use it like I did there. But again, less is more for sure. So we'll let the decals and that dry brush dry for a good few hours. Now we've got a oil-based paint um, that I made several years ago. So this is one of the Absablung um, oil washes uh, made from, sorry, Absablung oils made into a wash. So what I've done here, I think I've taken like engine brown with the black, I can't think of what it's called now. And I've mixed a black-brown mixture, uh, mixed it up with some odorless mineral spirits, give it a good mix-up. I've had this mix for years. It's been used on many, many models, and it's a great colour. So what we'll do, we're going to get all the recesses with this. So when we wipe it off, we're left with a nice wash that will accentuate any areas. What we can also do, because we're going on to a satin finish, if we brush over the wash near enough everywhere, when we wipe it off, it will kind of stain the paintwork. And that can give a real nice aged look to the paint. So there's two ways you can do it. You can go for a nice clean pin wash, or the way I like to do it is get the pin wash and then go around and cover all the areas like so. Let it dry. Next morning, we won't need any um, mineral spirit to remove it. It will take itself off because oils take forever to dry unlike enamels so it'll still be workable the next day so we'll just get a cotton bud the next day wipe it off and we'll be left with not only a nice panel line wash but some hopefully weathering to the flatter surface areas as well quite a lot of parts to do so we're going to show a few on camera but it's a case of just touch it like a pure action flow if you put too much on dry the brush off or just pick it up like i've done there Keep picking it up and taking it over. Your brush will always pick up the excess. And then, like I say, once I've got the panel line done, I tend to grab any excess and just spread it out all over the green. And there we go. Not forgetting our engine supports as well. These are quite important. Although these won't be getting used just yet, I thought I might as well wash it inside whilst we're at it. And again, same process as before. Let the pin wash do its job, and then we'll just brush on some of the wash, let it dry, and wipe it off. And hopefully, we'll have a nice weathering effect. So it's a nice, simple way, this. I like oils because they stay workable for quite a while. So you can really blend them. You can get them back off. The enamels, while they do take a while to dry, they dry a lot quicker than uh, oils. So you do have less kind of working time. Uh, and should you come back the next day like I am going to and not like the effect, then you've got to start using harsher chemicals to get them off. And that can ruin delicate paintwork and it can take a back step to your weathering that you've already done. So the oils are good. This is cheap to do. If you can buy a, a bottle of, uh, sorry, you can buy a couple of tubes of oil paint. Winsor Newton's a good one. Um, the odorless mineral spirit is quite expensive, but it's well worth the cost in my opinion. As you can see, I'm just giving the bottle a stare every now and then. And we're just loading everything up. 
and then this can all sit overnight and dry a bit my workshop stays is quite warm it's always around 22 degrees ish roughly through the day it's um coming into summer now in the uk so it's between 18 and 20 odd degrees outside it'll soon warm up so it's warm enough to let us dry and here we are the next day so we've just got a clean cotton bud there's nothing on the cotton bud at all yet that's just using the actual uh remnants of the wash that once we pick it up it'll just drag everything else off but like i say because we're putting this over a semi matte surface some of it will stay behind and stain and as you can see it gives us a nice weathered look and again on the front we want to leave most of it just in the panel lines and recesses but anything else left behind will give a nice stained look and again just adds another level of weathering love the chromate green it's a really striking color really nice and again where you put your decals on just be careful make sure they are fully set um Carefully, don't rip them off. You don't be undoing your hard work doing another part of the build. And there we go. Really getting there now. Any stubborn areas like this or areas you want to remove most of the wash, we've got some Santador from Windsor Newton on a cotton bud. And this will really shift most of it now. So in the foot controls, I literally just want to leave. The wash in there, we're going to add some pigments to these in the next part. And there we go. Same on the oxygen hose. Swipe it off, these are a real nice effect, and then our hose work as well. It's exactly the same, they've all been uh, washed exactly the same. And there we go. Head on over to www.umpretail.com and help support mine and Lee's business because without alternate modeling products, there would not be any international scale modeler and all the videos we put out there and the Facebook page and the forum we run. We stock loads and loads of modeling products, including all our own products of our Apex Airbrush, our pigments, primers, sanders, thinner and cleaner tools, our wonderful storage system, polish system, and weathering washes. We also sell modeling tools, paints, model kits, glues, solutions, fillers, weathering products, aftermarket, and of course, international scale modeler merchandise and gift cards. And all orders made before 12 midday get next day delivery in the UK, and international orders are shipped within 48 hours. Right then, seatbelts. So these belts, 132 scale HGW belts, are basically like car seat belts that you do harnesses, but 10 times more annoying because they're a lot smaller and a lot more fiddly. Again, I don't follow the instructions to the T. They can be very tedious and frustrating to build with the sheer size of them. So we're breaking out the Tamiya Optivisor to make sure we all, to some degree, we can see what we're doing. Highly rate this Optivisor, it's not cheap, but it is superb quality, typical Tamiya tool quality, very clear optical lenses, um, really, really good. So well worth the money for find. I was looking and found these cheap on eBay. I think I've got these £40, half price. So very happy. So we've got our photo etch shears from Zura, removing our first part. And it is basically the similar kind of assembly as the car belts. So we've got the main uh, harness itself, and then buckles, uh, connections and the side belts so that's it really treated pretty much the same um these are made of paper these are the double printed ones that are printed both sides so it's a case of pulling it through getting it to the point where you want it get it all nicely lined up and then pulling the other section through Like so, they are fiddly. Take your time. And there we go. Once you're happy, make sure you got it in the right position. If you want, you can always move it, but just be aware that these are not ribbon. These will break quite easily if you're too rough. So just take your time. And again, same for the other side. Get it lined up. Pull it through.
So if you need skill with the car ones, you need a lot more with these. These are very fiddly. I even broke up my Seizu Precision Tweezers for this. I've forgotten how fiddly these are. I'm very, very, very frustrated. But they look good at the end, so they are kind of worth the hassle. Stick with it. They are worth using for sure. So once we've got it lined up, make sure they're roughly lined up the same height. If they're not, you can move things around. Just get them so you're happy. So there we go. There's the main part of it done. We've got two clips to go on the bottom of each one, and then we can move on to the side part. I'm just having a look at the instructions. Instructions are very, very important on these. Make sure you pay attention to what you're doing. Um, you've got some peas cut off. Oh, there's my grey head. Hello. Um, and we've got some bending to do as well. So keep referring to those instructions. Got a Tamiya bending pliers. Just put a 90 degree bend on this part. Which is about to ping off on the bench. And I have to completely clear the bench to find it. So what I've done is I've flipped my mat round now. So if we drop things, we can see them easier. A little bit of CA glue on the side. We'll pop the connector, well, the buckle, sorry, we'll call it, through. We'll fold it over, a dab of CA glue. Fold it over, touch it. Job done. Fiddly, but they are worth the time. And we can repeat that for the other side as well. Once we're happy, we can grab our seat and line things up. Now, we do get the buckle for the back. You're never going to see it. So in my opinion, what's the point in wasting your time doing it? If you want to do it, by all means. But for me, it's a waste of time. We line it up where it's going to go. So there we go, like so. Make sure it's positioned roughly where we want it. Hold on to the back. Let the front lift up. And we're going to put some strategic CA glue on the tops of these. And then pull them back down. And glue them in place. We'll get it. We'll be like eighth time lucky. There's two. There's three. Oh, third time lucky. Third time's a charm. And the same for the other side. Pop it on, a little bit of glue at the top. And there we go. We get it all lined up roughly where we want it. Now, some of these seats on the F51, P51 would have had the lifeboat raft thingy behind them. Um, I'm not going to lie, I kind of forgot to do mine. But speaking to a few people, they wouldn't have all had them. Especially if they were flying over mainly land, which I think in Korea that's what they were doing. I may be wrong, someone's probably in the chat going, no, they did this and that. But we'll face facts. Man hasn't got it because I put all the belts on and I thought, oh, crap, I hadn't painted this. It was in the little box of all the little screws and what have you, and it just totally slipped my mind. So, yes, if it's supposed to be in there, mine's a special edition, and it didn't come with it. So we'll stick the back on, eventually. There we go, give it the tweezers, give it a good push with the old thumb. And there we go, it doesn't matter if it's not 100% straight, because it's only from the front that it matters. Now we've got the side part of the belt as well. Again, even fiddlier, little tiny bits to pop through. Then line up and build. So yeah, these are quite frustrating to build. I built a few of these over the years. But having done 24th and 12th scale and 16th scale cars for the last three years, I'd forgotten just how fiddly these were. So all we're doing is following instructions, building it up to the best of our ability, lining everything up. Tweezers come in very handy. You need steady hands and very good hand-eye coordination, which thankfully I do have. There we go. So we need to line it up and make sure the buckle is pulled through as much as we want it to. And then we can fold it through, like so. Like I say, you need very good hand-eye. This is where the Optivisor magnifier comes in very handy. These precision tweezers, the Sizos we sell at EMP, are absolutely fantastic. And then we can do the buckles for either end.
Again, if you get them cut properly with the Zoron cutters, there's need, nothing to file. It's all nice and smooth. So again, refer to instructions, make sure you get everything orientated the right way. Pop it in and through. Drop it. There was a lot of dropping, a lot of swearing, and a lot of feeling like I really don't want to do these seat belts, but stubbornness and persistence paid off. Because we do get them finished. So it gets slid through, a little tiny dab of Seagull on the back. Less is more, really is. You don't want to A, splurge out and stick to your fingers or completely ruin everything. And as you see, I just wiped off a little bit of excess. Then get our tweezers. And fold her over and stick. Now we'll repeat this for the other side, although there is a slight difference on the connector on one side. So pay attention to your instructions. Exactly the same, just with one different kind of harness connector on one end and a pad to go underneath. So here we go, we hold that, that's done, repeat for the other side, and then we can glue them in place. So again, we pop it on the side. Someone's playing the drums. No idea what's going on out there. Yeah, we get it all lined up, get it orientated where we want it. Like so, there we go, bit of a test fit. And then we can pull it up, grab some CA glue. And get it finally stuck in place where we want it. So like I say, these are very fiddly, they're not that expensive. I think they vary between eight to 15 pounds depending on the set. They are gonna test your patience. But in my opinion, they do look great, especially when you get a bit of a wash on them, which we'll do in a minute. They do look really good, but prepare for a frustrating hour or so. I think I was about 45 minutes doing these, and that's only because I'm so used to doing the car ones. So, yes, time well spent. The P ones in the kit are not great. They would need painting as well. Um, not a big fan of them at all. You can get pre-painted belts from like the likes of Edward, but I've found in the past that as soon as you start to bend them into shape, the paint cracks and falls off. So you really can't beat these more realistic, real belts that well are made for the job really. And there we go. Quick dab of glue, push it down, and there we go in place. So we've got the other one on there as well now. So we've got the same black brown enamel, uh, sorry, all wash that we had earlier. I'm just going to hit the belts and let the oil wash stain the fabric, paper fabric. And that will give us a nice bit of war, wear, worn look to the belts. And again, adds a little bit of interest. Helps create a little bit more visual interest. Final position. There we go. So as you notice, we glued the top of them, but we didn't glue the bottom so we can move those round. That was the idea around it. So what I did with the wash, I put some in the pot next to me. I had a few more drops of Sansador to really thin it down because I didn't want really thick wash on this. So it was a very, very thin oil wash compared to what we used on the other part earlier. And that way it'll stain. We can wipe off any excess should we require, which we actually didn't. Now I've got this lovely big lead pencil and we're gonna add some areas of interest to everywhere really. I've got this one, we've got a nice 3B pencil as well that I've had for absolutely years and years and years. You don't wanna see my pencil sharpener because apparently bro, my pencil sharpener's no good. I should have a better pencil sharpener. I don't want to get river counted or scrutinied of my pencil sharpener. To me, my beautiful purple blue 99 pence pencil sharpener means the world to me. And to hear it dissed on a video like it was last time I showed it, it really cut to the core. It really did. So we've got this one. This is a giant graphite stick. I got this off Amazon. Can't remember how much it was. But for large areas like this, it's really good because you can get in there really precise with the tip. And then we can use the flatter side, should we wish, to really go to town. 
and add some nice edge highlighting. Now, I've got this one and a 3B pencil that I use. They're both slightly different shades. I would say the 3B pencil is a bit more silver metallic than this. So it adds two different levels of weathering to whatever you're doing. But this is a great tool on armor, aircraft, engines, anything really. Anything you can see being used um, with this process, it'll do a good job of. So it's just a case of going around. Don't go mental. You know, don't be pressing really hard. There's no need to. Just run it over the parts. And as you can see, it really adds some nice definition. So we've got the dry brushing on there that's added uh, depth to the part fully and all the edges. And then we're coming with this and we've added real depth, like a metallic sheen to the edges. Now, once we hit it with our 3B pencil, it'll have another tone on there as well. And hopefully it'll just take away from that boring monotone black look. Because to put a wash in this, you're going to lose a lot of the effect with the black. Uh, unless you went grey, and I think that's too obvious a contrast then. But it's a personal choice, uh, whichever way you think looks best. And I, I like this. I've weathered a lot of things this way before. This pencil's fairly new. I think the first time I used it was on the Challenger build, if I remember right. Uh, but it does work really well. You can see it there on the exhaust manifold. Real nice effect. Really do like this. I think it was about £10, that pencil. That thing will last you forever. And it's that big. If a burglar broke in, you could probably knock him on the head with it and knock him out. Huge. Big, heavy lump of graphite. And as you can see, it really adds nice wear and tear to all those areas. Now we've got my old 3B pencil. This was from Hobbycraft. Oh, many, many moons ago. As you can see, we're going to go around all these parts. I've already been around this with the thicker pencil. So now I'm just picking out some areas of interest with the 3B pencil. And then we can do some scratches on the paintwork. We're basically using the edge of the pencil to highlight all the edges, just to give the simulation of a bit more whir. It just adds a bit of depth, and it really does work really well. It's a nice, simple technique. It's not too in your face. It works really, really well. So again, you can use the point. We've not got it really sharp. It's kind of rounded off, but we can use the point to add some scratches like so. And there we go. Look at look at the depth we've got there now with the wash, with the pencil edge in. It just adds a bit more interest to it. I mean, I'm no expert. This this isn't, you know, there's so many ways you can weather a cockpit. Um, but this is how I've done nearly all my aircraft over the years. Uh, as long as it gets some depth and tonal variation, I'm happy. So I'm chatting away. I think this was Sunday morning. We were live. I'm just chatting away on our live show as well. I do kind of get distracted from time to time. But not by considering I'm streaming, chatting to everyone, and filming videos as well. It's multitasking at its, uh, its finest. But you can see that it does bring the part alive does add a bit more visual interest and it's up to you how far you go um you can really go to town on it but i'm just rubbing lightly over areas we are revisiting some of them occasionally and again we used to add scratches we go over the black part again as well to get those looking really good Sky's the limit. Your choice, it's your, your vision, your model. Only you can judge how much weathering you need to do to it. But I just thought to show this entire panel from start to finish. Just how much I've done. And then we can put that to one side and work on everything else. There's lots of parts to do. So I'm not going to show them all. But another important one is the seat. The seat is a high wear area. So this would get lots of wear off the cockpit. Obviously, the pilots sat on their parachutes. So that was their cushion as such. But this effect works really well here on this. So I'm not going absolutely mad. I'm just adding some wear and turn in a few places. And there we go. Now, like I say, we can add scratches. 
so on and so forth. Lots you can do with it. Very, very versatile weathering tool. I think it works really, really well. So we've got our instrument panel again, and I'm just going to lightly run this over with the pencil as well to highlight some of the dials a little bit more. So we get a mixture of the dry brushing, the pencils, and again, it just had depth. I'm not doing every single part. We're just picking one or two to do. Same for some of the instruments and the uh, controls. Works especially well on black. As you can see. Like I say, it just takes away some of that monotonous color. Because if you look in and it's just a sea of black, it's like, oh, okay, we've got a little bit of weathering. It does add a little bit of depth. just makes things look a bit more interesting. And again, if it's bigger parts, and you don't want to be as precise, just grab the larger graphite pen, use the edges, and away you go. Right then, let's start getting some parts assembled. So we've got some of our Loctite Perfect Pen Ciego on one of our paint pots. And we're going to put some dabs where the parts are going to locate. Make sure they're orientated the right way, refer to instructions. We've still got some slight detail paint to do on this, but we kind of came um, to the end of the footage end, more than enough to make a video. So I thought we'd call it a day at the end of this, but we've got a few more uh, detail painting to do to the switches, add a little bit of colour in there as well. And we can add some pigment in there as well before we close up all the fuselage. So we're just referring to instructions. Make sure we get all these the correct way. I think these are radio boxes. These are set atop the uh, the fuel tank. Again, they, they tend to only go in one way. The locator points are pretty specific. So a couple of dabs of CA glue. Hold on for a second or two. Let the super glue do its work. If you're unsure, like I say, refer to those instructions. Just keep an eye on them. Make sure you go in between the different variants, A, B, and C, because there are different ones for two of the variants. The A and B are the same. The C is different. So make sure you're following the right instructions. You've got the right part. You put them in the right place. And there we go. As you can see, between the copper green, the black, and the silver, with them being weathered up, we've got a nice contrast there. Interesting looking parts. Right, so we'll pop the seat backs together, like so. Again, following our instructions, and then we're going to test fit the seat to see how that fits. Like I say, you can't see the back of that belt, so yeah, no real point doing the buckle. I mean, all, by all means, if you want to do it, do it. But I think you're wasting your time a little bit. So, very nice positive locating point for the seat. Pop that in together, push it home, hold it for a second, and there we go. Adjust your seatbelt again should you need to. And then we're going to add a slight wood effect to the floorboard. So these were plywood painted black, and obviously with the pilot's feet moving around inside, they would work through the black paint. So as a first stage, we're going to use a light wood colour from AK, and we're going to dry brush that in a back and forward motion, well, back motion really. So it'd be heavier at the front and less at the back where feet have been scraping on the foot controls. And again, same process as dry brushing. Load the brush up, get everything off that you can. Dry brush away. And then what we'll do is we'll come with a darker tone of wood, exactly the same, and blend the two together. And then we can come back uh, in the next part and add some pigments to add some nice wear and tear to the floor. You can leave it black if you wanted, by all means, but I thought I'm here. You're all watching. <laughs> I might as well do something. But we'll just add a very, very subtle darker tone here. Nothing to OTT. Like I say, we'll chuck some pigments on there next time. And add a little bit more depth to it as well. A few other bits and bobs to screw in place. 
screw in place, to glue in place. So again, reference your instructions. Make sure you get everything lined up properly. If you get any excess CA glue, get it off straight away. And you'll be quite lucky most of the time, not cause any damage. Like I say, less is more on the CA glue. You really don't need a lot. Pop it in. There we go. Make sure you've got none of your fingers. And then there's a, a brace at the back as well. Just need to glue it in place. So a couple of dabs of CA glue at the bottom. There's a couple of cater points at the back. Clips itself in place very well. So we've got two little bits at the bottom, say glued, and we'll put a little bit just behind that support brace there. Like so. And there we go. Intro panel. So on the edges, not on the decal, we're going to add some dabs of CA glue. Then we're going to push that into its locating points. Nice and positively. There we go. That's in place. It'll look quite good. Not too bad at all. We've got some colour to add to those as well, which we'll do in the next part. Like I say, when I came to the end of this part, I didn't think I was going to be ending it quite here. But when I put the footage on the Mac to edit, I was like, oh, okay, we've got loads. So it kind of ends abruptly this. Uh, but as you see, we glued the instrument cluster on the foot controls. And then we're going to put the sidewall detail in. And that is us for today. So it does end a little bit abruptly, just because I thought we'd be going a little bit longer. But for the most part, as you can see, the panel's looking good, weathered up now as well. For the most part, this is done. We've got, like I say, some detailed parts to do. And this is a very quick sneak peek of the cockpit. And that's all you're going to see for now. So there we go. Quite an abrupt ending there. Um, literally wasn't intending to end that video there. It was literally a break in recording while I did some work on the Ferrari. And I thought to secure the footage, I always upload it to the uh, iMac to make sure. And I had like five hours of footage and I thought, you know, that, that's probably enough because I knew I had a lot to go through and it made the perfect length video. So literally you've got me going, oh, there's the cockpit and that's it. That's all you see. So a little bit of a sneak peek, uh, but we'll be back in part three pretty soon. And we'll finish off the weather in the cockpit. We've got some detail paints there, a little bit of colour in there. We've got some switch gear to paint. Uh, we'll put some pigments in there as well to add a bit more of a weathering effect to it. We've got to do the radiator oil cooler housing to put in. Uh, finish off some weather on the engine as well. And then we can get the fuselage together and glue together, which is a major, major step to do on the build. So, fingers crossed, I'm hoping not to lose my mojo and we can get through this and get it built. Uh, because it's one of my favourite aircraft, one of my favourite kit. It's a beautiful kit. And I really do want to build aircraft, but to get your head around a mental block, it's quite hard to do if you understand where I'm coming from. But that's that. So next up will be part two of the Ferrari 288, which again is under progress, under progress of filming. Uh, we've got the chassis, suspension, running gear, brakes and wheels to do on that for the next part of that. I've got my Imperial Knight that I am absolutely itching to start. Um... And yes, but first off, tomorrow, Tuesday, which will be the 12th, 13th, oof, uh, is a bench update I'm going to do. And it's a big one because I've got a lot to go through. Uh, it's going to cover the future of what's to come on the channel, my own builds. Uh, you're going to be quite surprised at some of the stuff I've got to build. Uh, <laughs> we're going to chat about Patreon, and it'll be the last time we have an in-depth talk about it. Because I want to make sure I've got all, all those bases covered so everyone's on the same ball. And everyone knows what we're doing rather than confusion. So tomorrow's going to be focused on what I've been building, Patreon, what I've bought, what you want to have a look at. Because some of you are going to really gonna like what I've got. Um, and plans moving forward with the channel. With me being able to put more time into this, knowing I'm getting something out of it or having to worry 
about finding other means of um, funding. Uh, it means I can put more effort into the videos knowing, um, well, it's going to good use, basically. I always enjoyed making these videos. This definitely takes a strain off things. But anyway, I'm waffling. We'll talk about this tomorrow on the Bench Update. So make sure you stick around. Um, so as always, check out Intestinal Scale Model page, Facebook page and forum. If you want to support myself and the videos and keep them going, uh, I've got a Patreon link in the description of this video. Just click on the description. It's down below. Or there's a PayPal GoFundMe down there as well. So Patreon's a monthly subscription. Uh, and all the money towards that goes towards helping these videos with equipment, um, subject matter, and just helping along with the channel. Um, so yeah, they're there as well. Uh, check out my Paul ISM Facebook page as well for all my modeling, personal modeling work and updates. Everything goes on there. Um, check out uh, the Live the Bench page and the Off Air Hangout group for the live shows and the Off Air Hangouts. And of course, check out umpretail.com. We can get most of the things I use in my videos. Again, the links to all these and everything I've spoke about is in the description down below. And remember, there'll be nothing going behind a paywall with Patreon. Everything will still be publicly viewable. So don't get the wrong end of the stick. Please come watch my bench update tomorrow. It should be up around midday-ish, I would say. Um, and if you've got any comments, questions, anything you want to ask me, far away in the description. Uh, sorry, description. In the comments down below, I do read everyone, and it's a question I always answer them as well. Thanks for watching today. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Whilst it's not kind of the video I intended to put out, um, it's a part process of the build. So there we go. So thanks for watching. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye bye.